today's topic is how to negotiate the deal. Um, more importantly than that, really, you know, I'm not Chris Voss standing up here. If you guys don't know who that is, you should look him up because he is a negotiation expert, um, former FBI hostage negotiator. Um, and he actually has a lot of content that relates to real estate and just sales in general and how, how you can um, do that. But as a real estate agent, uh, you know, being in, being in the industry for a while, um, Lexus, do you mind asking them to, oh, I think they might've just done it, but anyway, um, turn the, the top volume down. Um, you know, a lot of times it's not about hard tactic negotiating whenever you're doing real estate deals or really any sales pitch in general. Um, a lot of times it's, it's problem solving. So find a motivated seller, figure out what their issues are, what's, you know, what their pain points are, and then figure out a way to uh, get from point A to point B and get them what they need. And you also get what you need, which is most of the time the property. So we're going to be more focused on that than kind of hardcore uh, negotiating through this. But today's agenda, like I said, we'll do the intro. Um, then I'm actually going to get into a, a little local market update just on the New River Valley here. Uh, our board office sends us out a monthly report on like sales and, and break it broken down between counties, uh, which is kind of cool to look at. And then we take that data and kind of make our own assumptions with it. But uh, it's pretty cool to look at. And then we'll talk about identifying uh, motivated sellers, uh, who they are, what they are, uh, you know, what makes them motivated sellers. And then we're going to get into an open discussion um, on negotiating and the problem solving aspect. So, you know, I've got a few deals where I've encountered motivated sellers or just sellers in general that, um, you know, have problems that need to be solved. And sometimes you have to get creative uh, to get them what they want. And at the end of the day, get what you want as well. So, so we'll get into that um, towards the end. And then I, I missed a bullet point up here. We actually have some, uh, we have some deals that we've either put under contract or that are coming up that, you know, can either be group deals, um, you know, partner deals or, you know, a, a sale if somebody's interested in it. So we've got some multifamily stuff. We've got some flipped or we got a flip property that we're looking at that's that's got some uh, some technical issues with it that that we're working through um, and then some future opportunities and investments as well. So we'll go through some of that stuff as we talk through it. So what is GRID, especially for the ones that, that weren't here last week? Um, GRID is actually a, they say, a global network um, of real estate investors, but it started in Northern Virginia. I think most of the chapters are up there. Uh, and it really is just kind of an, an aggregator of real estate knowledge, real estate investors, uh, bringing people together, doing deals together, uh, and trying to you know really grow your network, grow your knowledge, and, um, and push your real estate investing forward. We're not gurus. You know, I don't stand up here and say I know everything by far. Um, probably one of the youngest ones in here. Been in the real estate investing world for like six years now. So I've got some experience, you know, got quite a few deals under my belt, but there are a lot of topics that I'm not an expert on. So um, this is always a group discussion. We want to bounce things off each other, experience within the group, uh, and try and grow and learn that way. So, so. My intro. My name is Cody Drenell. If you guys don't know me, I know pretty much all of you so far. I uh, grew up in Giles County. I uh, went to school here, played football here, got a marketing and finance degree, which had nothing to do with real estate whatsoever. Um, like most people, got a, a sales degree um, right outside of college, moved up to Northern Virginia, um, kind of bounced around between startups and things along those lines. So I kind of got the, uh, the school of hard knocks when it, when it came to that stuff. Some of them were fairly successful. Some of them were pretty, uh, pretty unsuccessful too. So, luckily, I wasn't the the head honcho of those, but I, I definitely experienced the the pain as well. Um, why I started this group, you know, again, it was kind of surprising to me looking around uh, Blacksburg, Roanoke areas. Like, it's a ton of investment in these areas, and to not have a group where people are coming together and you know masterminding about about investing, about you know trying to grow your network, trying to do deals with each other or even just use each other's business uh, it was kind of kind of surprising to me so grid came up we figured it was a, a good way to get it started and they they provide the structure and things along those lines so obviously we want to accomplish everything we've already said um, and you can connect with us obviously with this group facebook i've got contact information over here 
Uh, we have an Instagram page up now that Alexis created this morning. So, <laughs> so if you want to follow that, just, it's Grid Blacksburg. So this is where we're gonna uh, we're gonna go around the room a little bit. Um, just tell us where you stand. You know your name. Are you currently an investor? Uh, what property types are you doing? Do you have another business that you run? It can be real estate related or not real estate related. You know, even though we're all in real estate here, we do business outside of real estate as well. So, however we can help each other, the better. Uh, what you want to learn here, and um, you know how you're hoping to benefit from the group. So, I will start. Uh, let's start on the right and go left. Katie <laughs> or Ethan. <laughs> And I'm also an office manager. I do not currently invest, but I am here to learn more about it. I'm Austin. Um, most of you guys know me. I am partners with Cody, uh, the broker of Gravity. And yeah, I've got Airbnbs and stuff. So I like to buy shitty properties and make them real nice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allie, and I'm a real estate agent over at the Gravity Group, and I'm kind of on the front end of investing, totally starting from scratch, just getting into it, and um, I have one property we're about to rent, actually, with the Gravity Property Management Group, so I'm excited about that, but I'm hoping to kind of hear from people that have a lot more properties, you know, how they got started, and go from there, and, you know, what they would do differently, and stuff like that. Hey guys, I'm Jamie Kreiner and I work with Gravity 2, the Gravity Corner over here. Um, I don't personally invest yet, would love to, here to learn all the things. Definitely worked on that side with buyers and sellers, so looking to grow here. Oh, they were trying to. I'm like, what is that? Appreciate it. Just speak into this. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm also a real estate agent with Gravity, um, and this is my husband Jared. We um, we kindly mainly just do like foreclosures, and then kind of flip them as much as we can. We kind of gotten out of that a little bit. Right now, we have a, a sixplex um, in Radford that we're dealing with. Um, six, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is here. Oh, you covered it. You covered it. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, my name is Josh Ruffalo. Uh, I'm a buy and hold investor, and uh, I'm also a lender. So do a lot of short-term uh, loans, bridge loans, and hopefully soon DSCR, but nothing yet. Yeah, yeah, I live in Richmond, but I cover the fund that will live in the whole state of Virginia. Kathy Leach. Um, I pr purchased my first uh, short-term rental in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, in April. And that was quite the experience. I am wanting to pivot and maybe do something different. I don't know if I want another one. Um, so here to learn and kind of just see what everybody else is doing and um, what other opportunities there are. Uh, David Maroney um, was, a, I guess, quote unquote, a professional investor for, for a while. Uh, now I'm a lender and invest personally just in buy and hold residential and some commercial things. and. And a small balance multifamily. My name is Andrew Weichel and I'm a newbie. Uh, just kidding. Um, I am an investor, uh, residential, commercial, small industrial, um, looking to develop relationships and find more deals. I'm Kendall. Um, I'm Andrew's wife and I am a stay-at-home mom to our three-year-old son and I try to keep things straight in the books and keep us organized. She keeps us out of jail. <laughs> yeah, that, that too. <laughs> uh, my name is Mikhail Mann. I'm an investor from Giles County. Specialized mainly in mobile home parks and duplexes, a couple single families. Uh, my name is David uh, Zier. I work at uh, G&H Appliance. If anybody needs appliances, I can be your appliance supplier. I used to do some home flips, but don't have time for it so much anymore. I uh, do have some rental properties and uh, you know, always looking, but not looking real hard right now just because of timing, but I uh, hope to soon. 
I'm Annabeth Kazusko. I'm from Richmond also, um, but we are Hokies and have always wanted to invest here and have started investing in some single family properties, would like to get into some multifamily and are and interested in other types of things, not sure what, mobile homes maybe. Um, and what else? I'm a, I'm a director of accounting at a property management company out of Chicago. Um, I think that's it. Ed Kazusko, she's my ride. Um, so we, yeah, we've got a few uh, rentals here in town, and then, like she said, we'd love to get into maybe multifamily, maybe mobile homes. Just trying to figure out what's next. I am currently a risk manager at Capital One, um, which has been a good company for a long time. But I'm kind of ready to be a little more, uh, do something different. Yeah. So. You guys snuck in the back. We just introducing ourselves. Introducing yeah, yeah. What we do. Oh. How you, what's your background? Um, my name is Jamie Oliver. I'm not a chef. Um, I'm a professional poker player. I take money from Cody regularly. Uh, no, in all seriousness, I was right, but every about weekly. And um, and uh, no, seriously, I own uh, Highlander Construction Development. We're a general contractor and a developer in the River Valley. We've been in business since 1997. And um, so we do, we develop land, we, we build for clients, we build for ourselves on, on some properties. And uh, Cody and I have uh, been looking at a number of different projects together. And, and uh, there you go. Yeah, sweet. Great, uh, great speech. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm Justin Wheeler. I'm a superintendent for this guy. Uh, work all of his construction jobs. And um, yeah, out of, out of Lynchburg. So I commute a little bit, but it's fine. Other than having to put up with him, it's everything's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Have you already went? Yeah. Oh, sweet. Oh, boy. We Thank you, guys. That's, uh, that's always helpful. You know, obviously, kind of start connecting dots when you hear people's uh, occupations. And you want to talk? Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll have a networking session after this. Make sure you go up and introduce yourself to people and, and see how you can. Uh, how you can benefit from each other. So we'll jump right into it. Uh, for you guys, we kind of went over the uh, agenda real quick. You're good. We're talking about um, kind of identifying motivated sellers, some areas that you can look to try and find deals, uh, some you know red flags or I guess green flags for, for us on what a, uh, what a motivated seller you know might show in listings and things along those lines. And then we're going to have an open discussion about some, some deals that, that people have done around that. So um, I have to say this, the, uh, this is not financial advice, anything I say, make sure you do your own research, uh, not an accountant, you know, not a financial planner, uh, make sure you do your due diligence, what I, take everything, most of what I say at least, with a grain of salt. Um, and then this is our release notice, you know, we're filming here, we've got people watching on uh, Facebook Live, uh, we'll, you know, take some videos and some pictures that will go out on social media, so. This is essentially the consent form. If you have any issues with anything going up, just come and let me know. We'll make sure you're not in it. Blur your face out or something. But So we said we get into a market update for the NRV. I um, <clears throat> Again, this comes from our board office, and they do this monthly. I guess I need to stay in the frame. So I found this interesting. The market uh, dashboard on this side, you can see year-over-year -year change sales are down 17%. Pending sales are down 12%, but the median sales price has actually been pretty stable. It's up. It's actually up 1% um, from last year, which is, you know, if you listen to the news enough, you would be like, there's no way that that's true, but this is actually the data coming from our MOS. Um, then you look down at active listings, those have actually gone down a little bit as well. Um, so the lesser listings is obviously playing into the sales uh, pending price or pending sales. And obviously, you know, especially being a real estate agent, we've experienced a lot of people that say, well, I've locked in a 3% interest rate either with a new purchase or a refinance on my house. Why would I move anywhere unless I absolutely have to? So that's, that's keeping uh, active listings down. Um, and it's also keeping the median sales price at a pretty stable level. So you know, don't listen to everything that you hear in the news. 
prices have actually stayed pretty steady. Um, and some areas have even have even gone up over that 1% mark. So taking that data <clears throat> and then looking at this county breakdown, can you guys see past my head? It's interesting to see, you know, they did like a, like a year over year, April versus April. Um, but you can see some of, the, some of the counties that stick out are like Giles County um, had a change from an average days on market from 31 days on market down to nine days on market. Uh, you look at you look at Tazewell County. It went average days on market are about half of what they were back in 2022. Um, Galax, you know, Radford and Montgomery County are actually trending the opposite way. So at least from my perspective, what that tells me is people are looking, especially with prices being a little bit inflated, interest rates going higher. People are looking outside of those kind of more populated, uh, higher price range areas. They're going to Dallas County, they're going to Tazewell County, they're going to Galax, Bland, um, where the prices are a little bit more reasonable and they can afford that, you know, 8% interest rate or 6, 7, 8% interest rate. So I always thought that was interesting. You know, when you start looking at doing flips or something like that, this is definitely something to, to keep in mind. There's obviously a higher demand for the price range in these areas. Um, but we'll do this every month, see how much it changes. If it hasn't changed much, maybe we'll We'll look at a different kind of market update, but always something that we find interesting. And with your email, if you guys signed in, we're going to send these slides out afterwards. So if you want to go back and look at the at the data and use it in any way, you're more than happy to do that. <clears throat> so get right into it. Um, what is a motivated seller? So for a seller to be motivated, it's got to be something going on in their lives to motivate them. Um, like we said before, we're problem solvers, you know, not necessarily professional negotiators. So how do we identify the problem with that seller and then uh, provide a solution in that way? So first thing is two biggest motivators for most people are either their circumstance or their emotions. Circumstance being the seller may be motivated certain things, the property condition, you know, it's abandoned, needs work. There's been fire, water, mold damage. Um, they think it's unsellable. You know, on the open market, they wouldn't get the price that, that they think it's worth. So, you know, an investor is going to come in most likely and buy it. Uh, it needs too much work. Somebody's not going to use it as like a single family occupied home. Um, finances, they can't afford repairs um, or they moved recently and didn't have an agent that was savvy enough to like help them line that that process up so um, you know now they're sitting there with two mortgages or it didn't sell in the time frame that they thought it was going to sell um, so they've you know they've got two payments now which obviously no one wants that they're pretty motivated to get rid of that thing um, any time frame or external pressures it's a pre-foreclosure kind of going back to finances um, needs the cash flow needs the money for something that's a, a thing that comes up a lot of times um, <clears throat> and then just your convenience you know absentee landlord Somebody that moved out of state, uh, we see it a lot. People that inherited a property after a after an estate sale or after uh, you know someone per someone dies, and they just don't want anything to do with it. Um, so they're just you know trying to offload it. Don't really care what the fair market value is sometimes. So then emotional, um, you know, the owner no longer loves the house, um, and for some you know some rhyme or reason is emotionally attached at this point. So. That can be the condition of it. You know, they don't have time, or they don't have the money, or they've kind of, you know, jobs have changed. They just don't have the, the resources that they need to make the repairs. So they're trying to get out from under it. Um, you know, they're embarrassed to put their property up on the market. You know, a lot of times I'll, I'll run into this with clients that don't want to sign in the yard because they don't want people looking at their pictures that live next door and being like, how would they let their house get in that, in that manner? Um, so that's, you know, they're going to have to look at alternative ways to sell their house. Most likely that's going to be go to somebody that can sell it off market, most likely to an investor or something along those lines. Um, or at least, you know, they're, they're at least not getting top dollar by putting it on the MLS. They have bad tenants and, and poor cash flow. So those are some of the most common um, ways for motivated sellers. The seller's motivated by circumstance, need the house sold a lot of times. Um, the seller's motivated by emotion, just want the house out of their life. They don't want to think about it anymore. They want to walk away. 
you know, take a little paycheck and, and be done with it. So then we go to finding the deal. Um, these are just some of the ways that, that have worked for me. Um, you know, also kind of open this up to discussion because I'm interested to hear how other folks find deals um, and use that if we can. Driving for dollars, essentially that's just driving around neighborhoods. You know, you look for homes that have grown up yards and boarded up windows and um, try and get in touch with that seller, look it up in the GIS. Uh, if you guys aren't utilizing the GIS, that's definitely something to get familiar with. Uh, that's how you pull up the tax card and look at who, what the owner's name is. Um, and you can kind of, you know, reverse a lot of times into getting their contact information. Um, one of the biggest ones, obviously, that's why we're here, networking. You know, off-market deals are, are my favorite way to, to do deals, especially right now. Is anything that does hit the market, like we said, there's still a high demand for housing. So you're competing. Um, you know, you really want to try and get in there before the, you know, the rest of the, the world sees it. Um, foreclosures.com, we've got a subscription there. They show bankruptcies, pre-foreclosures, houses that are in foreclosure, um, and they they assign a, I don't know, butcher this, but they usually assign an, some sort of attorney um, that settles the estate or is in charge of it. So it's in pre-foreclosure. You know, a lot of times you can get in touch with that attorney. Um, the bankruptcies as well. It's not always that a bankruptcy, the, the housing is involved, but if you call that attorney that's listed on that, on that site, um, he can tell you, yes, this is going to be part of the sale. A lot of times you might be able to kind of weasel your way in there before it actually hits the market. So that's been a good one for us. Um, the HUD home store, most of the time um, those end up on the MLS too because HUD has to assign an agent that's a HUD agent. Um, but I've bought some of my best single family houses through the HUD home store. You know, they, they're not scared of taking low ball offers. You don't get like shadow banned or anything like that by submitting super low offers. And it's been on the market for a while. Like you never know. So kind of shoot your shot there, see what happens. Uh, Facebook or Craigslist. This is obviously at least most of the time somebody trying to do it themselves. We call it FISBO for sale by owner. Um, and, most of the time they don't have the experience to know, you know, it's, they're either underpricing it a lot of times or they're also way overpricing it themselves. So their, their expectations are, are kind of out of whack, but um, you get in there and, you know, you can negotiate a little better when there's no commission involved. Um, you can, you can kind of use that as a tactic and being a real estate agent, you know, sometimes we do that. We say, Hey, I'll save you. $20,000 by not putting it on the market and have to pay in real estate agents. Let's take that off the sales price. So things like that. Uh, they don't have proper marketing behind it. The MLS is obviously a good one. Believe it or not, you can still find deals on there. Uh, we're going to get into what things to look for for houses listed on the MLS um, that can tell you what a motive, like it might be a motivated seller behind that. Um, and then, yeah, obviously. So we want to open that up. Do you guys have any other any other tactics that you use, sites that you go to? You know, they're not all listed up here, but curious to hear. What's up, Andrew? Is that so? Are you able to do that online? Because I've always been curious about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, how do you do that on the courthouse? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Sure. Interesting. So where is that listed on the um, like on the courthouse website? Like, do you have to go? What is the like? What, oh, you have to go to the house to the courthouse. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, cool. Sure. Doing some research. 
There All is right. an online way to do it if you're not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> How much are we talking per month? It's like a like couple hundred dollars? Probably about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we do? Is that Deeds Online? You can use that? Oh, okay. Gotcha. I didn't know you could do that through there. All right. <laughs> I was going to say, if you if you use a gravity agent, you can. that's a free resource. So, Anybody else have any, any tactics, any sites, or? Publicnoticevirginia.com? Okay. Really? Right, right. They probably just pull the data from that main website and then charge you for it. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Nice. Do those usually go to market or are the people, are they auction or? Yeah, somebody will figure it out. Right, right. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. There's one I've heard about that um, involves taxes. Like if there's back taxes on a on a property, you can elect to, and I I don't want to butcher this, but you can elect to. To pay the tax lien off, or or pledge the tax lien, or something like that, and if they don't pay it by a certain date, then you essentially like foreclose on the property and take over ownership. Um, but again, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how that works or how to access it. So that's a, that's another one that I've I've heard about. So cool. So common signs to look for. Obviously, we were just saying rundown exterior. Um, you know the. Yards grown up, roofs falling in, windows are boarded up. Like that's a, a seller that either is just completely um, negligent or you know maybe doesn't know what to do with the property. So, so those are good ones when you're driving for dollars, trying to trying to figure out those. Um, if you see any yellow or red tape signs on doors, um, that's typically a foreclosure or an eviction. You know that's a I don't know why they use the yellow tape, but I guess probably to make sure that they get their attention. Um, but if you see that driving down the road, it's worth stopping. You know, maybe not walk up on their front porch because you don't know who's up in there, but um, at least monitor it. You know, look it up in the GIS, see who the owner is. Um, you know, maybe use the tactic Andrew's talking about, seeing if there's any liens on it or or tax liens or or anything along those lines. Um, fast price changes. That's one that um, you know, if you if you look at the MLS and you see a property come up, and within the first five, six, seven days of if they do a price drop like right away, first week, that's kind of tells you like, hey, this person is is looking to to get rid of it um, fairly quick. You know, most of the time, if somebody's fairly fairly comfortable with keeping the property on the market for a while, they they won't do a price drop that fast. So that's just kind of one of those red flags. Uh, another one is back on the market. You know, sometimes, and especially in our situation, we have that a lot. Uh, you know, you'll get a property under contract, they get a home inspection or, or something goes wrong with the buyer and this can might have gotten kicked down the road for 30, 45 days already. And then something happens, contract falls apart. The timing, you know, at that point probably is pretty, uh, hasn't lined up with the seller's expectations. They're either get, starting to get desperate because they have already moved and that second mortgage is start kicking in um, or they were just ready to get rid of this property. So. You see something go back on market, there's a good chance, you know, you could come in, I wouldn't say make a lowball offer, but you could get that property at more of a discount than what it was listed at um, because they're ready to just to be done with it. 
Um, and then looking at MLS verbiage. So these are kind of fun, but uh, realtors have a way with words <laughs> whenever they're writing a listing description. Um, so you can you know, kind of parse through that when you see a listing come up. Anything that you see that says as is, you know, seller motivated, put close preferred, will not go FHA, uh, bring all offers. You know, a lot of that is based around this property needs a lot of repairs um, or, you know, I'm ready to get out from under it, want a quick closing, uh, just bring me any offer. I'll try and work with it. Those are ways to, you know, kind of zone in on, on that listing, see what you can do. Uh, and then these are the fun ones that you can kind of read between the lines. It says it needs some TLC, obviously needs some work with a little elbow grease. It's one of my favorite ones. Fixer upper, um, one that says there's endless potential. Usually means you need to put a lot of money into it. Um, and then a blank canvas. So, you, you know, you guys kind of, you understand what that is, but but I, I hear it more and more. And that usually means there's going to be some work involved. And if there's work involved in deferred maintenance, you're probably going to get the property at, at a bit of a discount. So just things to look out for. So then your phone rings um, or you get in touch with one of these sellers. And, and now what do you do? What's the process? You know, obviously most the folks here are pretty experienced, so this is kind of basic stuff. Um, but just things to remember. You know, obviously, be friendly, be authoritative uh, when you're on the phone. You know, we have sellers and buyers all the time that tell us they've done this. They bought seven houses. And I'm like, we did that last month. So, you know, you are in an authoritative position, being an investor or being a realtor and having these conversations. Like, just because they, you know, feel like they have a lot of experience and they've done this five, six, seven times over their lifetime, you know, most likely you have more experience than they do. Um, and obviously be friendly, don't come off as, as arrogant, but um, there, is, there is a way to talk to folks to let them know that you know what you're doing, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're not shooting from the hip here, um, and you're gonna, be, you're gonna be fair about it, so. And step two um, is determining what their motivation is. So after you get their basic info, you know, start asking some open-ended open -ended questions. How'd you hear about us? Is the house currently on the market? Um, if so, have you had any offers? That's always a good one when you're talking to FISBOs. Um, you know, if they've had it up for 30, 45 days, haven't had a single offer or showing, you know, we like to ask how many showings they've had. That's a good sign that it's probably overpriced or they're not doing a good job marketing it. Um, they're probably getting frustrated. It's potential um, that you could get that for a discount. You know, why are you selling it? When the last time the kitchens, bathrooms, uh, everything were renovated, uh, if, you know, they say back in, you know, 1990, then you know there's probably some work involved in it. Uh, the roof, HVAC, you know, big systems, water heater. These are all things that, that kind of take you to that authoritative position too. They know that you're serious when you're asking the right question. Here's some others. What else needs to be fixed? Uh, is the mortgage current? If it's not, what is the status? Uh, who's the lender contact? You know, if, they, if they've just gotten into uh, forbearance or foreclosure, you could have a chance to come in and, you know, save the day, um, you know, pay off what they have and, and get them out from under it. That's actually one of the examples I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit. Um, how much is owed on it? That, that tells you kind of a baseline um, where you could start. If they owe, you know, they've got second mortgage on the property that's maxed it out and it's still in a delinquent state, you can kind of, you know, figure out if you want to pursue that or not. And then how much they're asking or how a lot of times I say, how much would you like to walk away with? Uh, and then, you know, you can get a little creative with the deal to get them that money, whether it's owner financing or, you know, whatever it takes to, to get them what they want. After that, obviously you set the appointment. Um, you want to get in the house. Uh, the seller's there, have them show you the house. Uh, make sure, this is a big one for us, make sure all the parties that are responsible are available and are there. Um, you know, these, it's, it's really it, kind of frustrating when you get to the house and they're like, well, this is actually in a trust and it's me and my seven uh, brothers and sisters and they live all over the U.S. and some of them live in Europe. And it's like, well, you know, we've got to, this is going to take a lot longer. So make sure you ask those qualifying questions. Um, get in, ask them if everyone is in agreement to sell. You know, a lot of times we're, we're reading between the lines when people are talking. You know, I've gotten pretty good over the years at 
figuring out if someone's kind of BSing us or not. You know, you can, you can tell body language, things like that. So all these questions kind of, kind of lead you into that. Uh, and do they have all the paperwork and title information, things like that, to, to actually sell the property to you? Because once you get past this point, you're ready to make the offer if all the boxes are checked. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. You know, we actually have a whole, um, we actually have a whole presentation. I think in a couple months on creative deal, um, creative deal structures, how to make offers, um, how to you know get to that point B that that the that the seller wants you to. So we won't get into that making the offer too much here, but um, that's kind of the gist of that. Yes. Step three seems to imply that you were making the offer on that first trip. So step three and four are kind of, they can kind of be paired together. So are, you, are you going there and looking at the house and making an offer before you get to your car and drive home? It depends on uh, those qualifying questions, right? So, you know, if, if when I ask, what would you like to get for the property? Because I'm doing my due diligence up front. You know, I'm, I'm looking at it from the outside. Maybe I've gotten in and, um, you know, when we're on the phone the first time, I'm asking when was the last time it was updated? How's the roof? You know, how's the HVAC systems? And I see, you know, the tax assessment for this is at 120. Uh, and then you go to the house, everything checks out when you walk through it, and you ask them what they want to walk away with, and they say 80,000. And you're like, I'm making an offer right there. Um, and I'll, I'll bring paperwork with me, whether it's filled out or not. Uh, I won't show them that, obviously, when I get there, but you kind of keep it in a folder or something or in your bag. Um, and if, if things check out, you know, don't, I don't like getting like frantic and be like, oh, I'll offer you right now. Because then kind of red flags kick up. But, you know, you, 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 play, uh, you play it cool. And, and a lot of times I will make the offer right there if it, if it does check out. So um, sometimes I have to – I'm the worst at this, actually. Um, Hannah knows best because we just went through this. But I will go home and stew on it for, like, weeks at a time sometimes. And it – <laughs> like, I saw you looked at the document. Are you going to sign it? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but honestly, the more I do it, the when I have those like, like back and forth, 90% of the time I realize that like me not just walking away and having that debate with myself means that I should go, I should go through with it. Um, you know, if I, most of the time I'm pretty good at saying, this isn't a good opportunity. I'm just gonna walk, not not waste my time. If there's all that back and forth, it's probably just me like talking, trying to talk myself out of it. When you know, in reality, I just need that little little kick to to move forward with it. So, um, yeah, that's part of it. So, I want to open it up now. I'm curious to hear um, you know some of the deals that you guys might have had. I'll get into a couple of mine. Um, but I don't, you know, I've been up here talking for enough at this point. When we get through this, I do have some uh, investment opportunities that are coming up. We haven't necessarily ironed out all the details, but I want to put them out to the group. You know, if somebody's interested in one of them, uh, definitely want to um, come let me know. And we can either set up like a luncheon, which we're going to do with another opportunity, um, or I can just keep you in the loop as we move forward with those opportunities. So has anybody had a deal here recently um, where they had a seller situation that was maybe a little unique or, you know, they were motivated or they had a problem that kind of took you a couple more steps than normal to, to solve for them? Nobody. Nobody's doing deals? <laughs> That's why we're here. That's why we're here, huh? Did you get your eyes dilated this, today or something? <laughs> Um, so I can share, I can share our first deal. I would, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Um, so we, we've got a son here at Virginia Tech, which is alumni. So right. we, back in 2000, before the world blew up, or 2020, 20, I always do that. Yeah. Um, 2009. We, we were putting all, we were, we refinanced our house in Richmond, pulled the cash out. We were making all cash offers and not getting out. Sure. So, you know, we'd go five over, no inspection, someone would come in higher. Right. And we found one, it was listed, it was a previously a foreclosure where someone had bought it and they realized it was too much work. And uh, we looked at it and we said, no way. Yeah. It's too much work. And then we realized there's nothing else here that we're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the price was good. Like, it was well, well below market value, but it needed a ton of, a ton of work. 
plumbing, electrical, uh, flooring. Sure. And it was bigger than we wanted. Um, so we, we walked in it like two or three times and finally realized we could kind of lay it out a little differently and create some space on the back for us to come visit where we're staying now. Yeah. And uh, rent out the front to my son and his roommate. Nice. Um, and so we uh, we put in an offer. It was, you know, right about what he was asking for. Them. So we didn't really solve any of He wasn't getting any action. Sure. And it wasn't listed well. I think the, the, the catchphrase that they had on there was, um, Experienced investors only. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's a new one. And that wasn't us. Yeah, right. This was our first you know, house we were buying that we weren't going to live in. Sure. But we knew we we knew we wanted a house in Blacksburg, so we made an offer under asking price. Yeah. Asking price. Yeah. And he took it, and then we started rapidly searching Craigslist for uh, contractors. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. With some success and some failures. Yeah, I know the feeling there. Yeah, you run into run into some of those handymen that. Yeah. Promise you the world doesn't work out, but no, that's great. Yeah. Um, and again, it goes back to the, the terminology. Next time you see that on a listing, you'll be like, okay, <laughs> I know what I'm getting into. Does anybody else have one? No. So I'll go next. Um, I guess it was so in, in Giles County, uh, where I grew up, there's a, a neighborhood called Fort Branch, and it's full of what they call these. Uh, they call them Selenese houses because if you know much about Giles, there's a big factory in Giles called Selenese and they manufacture chemicals and like fibers and things along those lines. Um, so that came into town in like the mid 40s, like early 40s to 50s. And Giles was essentially very low population at that point. So they had thousands of workers coming in uh, with no housing. So the. Um, these neighborhoods, they all literally built the same house, like like cookie cutter style, like changed up the layout a little bit, like maybe had a bedroom on this side versus that side, um, but they were, they were all built same time period. I mean, they're built like brick shit houses, honestly. Like they are the best foundation, like the best builds that I've even seen in houses that were built in the 80s and 90s. Um, so I bought my first one and then my cousin lived next door and she actually, um, she actually moved, and we bought hers. And then my brother bought the house to live in, two houses down from the first one that I bought. And I was just like, I have to get this fourth house. Like, we got to complete this row up here. Um, was reaching out to the seller. You know, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He had another guy that had reached out to him before that said, I'll give you a cash offer. Um, and he was like, No, I'm keeping it as a rental. And I like over. The, this I was like a three-year period I just watched the thing like like continually get worse and worse like didn't have good tenants in it it was you know getting run down um, and I you know probably once a year I would reach out to this guy and be like hey you still interested you still interested wasn't wasn't having it but then one day and this was about about eight months ago at this point one day he called me up and he said I'm ready to sell the house he said my mom got cancer um, I need to build out my basement and so she can come live in it with me. He said, I'll sell it to you um, for what I owe on it plus X amount um, you know, that I need to, to finish out the garage. And again, kind of knew that market already. The other houses that we'd renovated and rented out were, I think they appraised at like 165, 168 range. Um, first one I bought was for 80000 we did like ten thousand dollars worth of work, and then that price for that, I was like, "Damn, this is this is a ticket." Um, and we figured out what he owed on it. He only owed sixty thousand on his, so he ended up wanting an extra fifteen on top of that. Um, but at the time, didn't really, you know, we had we had bought some other stuff, and I didn't necessarily have the funds to make up the difference of what he wanted. So did something creative with with his loan, kind of like assumed his loan. Um, without having to put money down and then got him the 15 K from a, another private person, um, you know, to kind of get him what he needed. And then we renovated it, rented it out and then turned around and refinanced it. Um, and that one appraised it at like 165, I think. So, you know, that was a situation where you, you've found the property, you know, continuously like reach out to them, let them know you're still interested. Uh, you just never know, like one day he's going to reach out and say, I'm in this dire situation. I would have probably paid 120 for it if he would have sold it the first year that I reached out to him. 
So obviously, you know, you never know when the situation is going to come up. When the seller's motivated, you're going to get a better deal, um, you know, than than just normal situations. So. How are, how are you reaching out to them by mail or phone? So this is a little sketchy trade se <laughs> trade secret. Um, there's a website What's that <laughs> no, there's a website called FastPeopleSearch.com, and you can't do it with LLCs because they have like a registered agent, but you can literally type somebody's name in and where they um, where they live, like at least just. I think I think it's either town or county and state, which you can get off the GIS. Like it shows their registered residence, so you know, like John Doe, not the address of the property, but the address that it's registered to, and you type this in fat, fast people search, and it will give you every address that John Doe has ever lived at or has been registered to him, and every phone number that's ever been registered to him, as well as his family members' phone numbers. So that is. And I don't tell people that, obviously, when I call them. Um, luckily, I don't have a lot of questions asked. I think people just assume these days, like, you're going to find my information one way or the other. Um, but that that's how I do my kind of dirty dirty work. Yeah, yeah. Out of the blue. Yep. And I say, hey, look, I've got the property beside yours. And they don't know. I mean, you could have got the info from the tenant or something like that. But as long as you're friendly, a lot of times I don't, I don't get a lot of flack. Um, and we do the same thing, and you can do that with uh, – expired listings if you have access to the MLS or you have access to a realtor who has access to the MLS um, you can go through expired listings that someone was trying to sell and didn't work out obviously so you know that they have a reason to sell they're most likely still wanting to sell you can it shows who the owner is you can put them in this system you can call them up hey why didn't your house sell are you still interested in selling yeah I'm interested in selling well if there's not a realtor involved you can save you know thirty thousand dollars on commission I'd be willing to offer you this for your property or at least come see it and see if it checks out so those are some of the ways that we kind of like play the system there which is ethically like we'll, we'll haven't gotten trouble yet I guess but Dave it, it kind of reminds me of the situation so we bought a house at Christiansburg and we bought it and we're introducing ourselves to the neighbors um, hey if you ever sell let, let them let us know Right. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And you know, sometimes I'll I'll negotiate that deal um, down to what what they want to net. You know, so like we say, if there was a realtor involved, you know, you'd you'd have you'd have to get 130 uh, to net 100. I mean, that doesn't that math doesn't add up, obviously, but it'd be a hell of a commission on a hundred thousand dollar house. Um, but whenever you put it under contract at 100, you can go back to the seller and say, look, you know, I'm coming out of pocket for 25,000. Since you're okay with netting 100, could we make the purchase price 115, and you pay me 15,000 at closing? You still net the same price. I'm paying a little bit more on my loan, but I'm also keeping money in my pocket, so I can go out and do another deal here, or there. You know, right? Yeah, it has. You have to make sure it can appraise. But a lot of times, a hundred to, you know, fit, adding fifteen thousand on it wouldn't affect it depending on how bad it is. Yeah. So, anyone else? Come this way a little bit, Hannah. I think the music's kind of drowning you out. Those things are good. If you guys get food after the pork belly tacos, things are mean. I think if, if, you, if people see the 
offer to let it go. I don't Yeah. I mean, people come to me all the time with this. Um, I'm not the most desirable property, but people like Cody Bile, and I can usually. Yeah. <laughs> I can usually I'll show you one here in a second. You guys are going to be like, whoa. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah, it's always good when you have nice when you have that like double exit strategy, right? So like, you know, you kind of planned on renovating them and then renting them out and refinancing it, but you still had the exit where you bought them so so low that you could you could sell them. So it like de-risks everything that you're doing, which is nice. And it's funny when you get when you're you've either been in a market and done deals enough or <clears throat> you know, you grew up there or live there, like it's so much easier to spot deals. You don't have to overanalyze it because you know this house down the street. You know I know sold for 150, and it had one less bedroom than this one. So you know it really comes down to how much is going to cost to renovate it, uh, making sure your numbers are right and that you're you're not missing something. Uh, but that actually is what we're going to do next month. So um, you know I've got my pretty face on here, but we're actually going to bring somebody in for this one. Um, I'd like to get somebody that does a lot of rehabs, does a lot of flips, uh, maybe a contractor that can speak on the, um, you know, how to estimate the, these projects. Uh, but we're going to talk about how to rehab for big profits. I think they have like a like a three step process that that you can go over. Um, it's going to be July 26th, so we always meet the last Wednesday of every month um, at 6 p.m. So everybody, I want to get some feedback on that. We had. 
We moved it to six this time because people wanted to get here after work. Did that seem to work out for everybody fairly well? Yeah? Okay. So no, re no request to move it back. All right, good. So we'll get this up. We'll have an email sent out, you know, calendar invite, stuff like that, like we've been doing. But we'd love to see you guys back here for that, too. Um, and we'll, if you have anyone that, you could, that come to mind um, that do a lot of rehabs or flips or, you know, the burst strategy and is pretty seasoned in it, I'd love to get some guest speakers up here um, to speak to us on that stuff. So just keep that in mind. Reach out to me. Um, so these will be fairly quick, but wanted to get into some upcoming deals uh, in the in the area. Uh, this row of townhomes, I don't know how familiar you guys are with Radford, but um, I've got I've sold a couple houses for the uh, Willow Creek um, properties guys over in Radford. They've got a ton of investments over there, um, and this one's coming up. They they gave me a permission to go ahead and start, um, you know, pushing it out, especially to you guys. Uh, but it's it's this six, and then a separate owner owns this one. So don't worry about that. Uh, the end. <laughs> I tried already. I saw him outside one day, and I was like, "Hey, buddy." He's like, "No." <laughs> He's like, "Go." <"Gone." laughs> I was like, "What do you want to buy the rest of them?" He's like, "No." Nah. <laughs> so uh, at least I tried, but. There's a mix in here. The end units are four bedroom, three bath. Uh, there's three other, um, three other three bedroom units, and then two two bedroom units. So this one is, I don't know if you guys know much again about Radford or Tyler Ave, but these are like super hard to comp out because they're very high end. Um, at least when you're comparing it to the other townhomes right next to campus in Radford. Um, so the only comps I could really pull on them were from uh, like Heron's Landing, like that, and obviously that's not that comparable because this is on campus essentially, and that one is uh, beside a golf course. <clears throat> that's true, which I ate at last week, and it was pretty good. I don't know if you've been up there yet, but it's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So uh, so this one's coming up. Um, you know, they're obviously Class A properties. Uh, most of them are rented out right now. They're kind of doing uh, turnovers, uh, which doesn't, you know, doesn't help it on the listing side. I think that might be actually what they're waiting on to get it up on the market to try and sell them as a package deal. There's not a lot of value add here per se because they have been updated. They're fairly new, um, but they're like premier properties right in the middle of Radford. It's going to be more of a, you know, put a decent amount down, um, cash flow it as well as you can, but let the properties appreciate over time. You know, not necessarily my model um, for investing. One because I don't have a ton of capital to just drop on two million dollars. But um, you know, as a group, or if somebody has a fund, you know, it's it's possible. Uh, or if you're you know just looking to park money instead of having a bunch of work involved or a bunch of management behind it, or you know have to worry about stuff breaking. Uh, Willow Creek Properties. Yeah. So they've. They bought a ton of stuff from uh, Jeff Price. Not, not two. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, but two of the units are not rented at the moment. So they're trying to raise rents and get those up. And they, they raised rents on three of them, uh, which got leased out. And those two, they're still kind of showing at the moment. So again, I'll, I'll send these out. If anybody's interested, I can send you the rent rolls because I do have them. I just don't, I didn't I remember it off the top of my head. So. Yes, this is their list price. So, no, they did not. Yeah, they did comps because clearly, if it's not rented at the moment, um, you know, and it's gonna, it's not the best cash flowing asset. That's why I was saying it's gonna be more of a appreciation play. Um, so that's kind of kind of where they where they land on price, and I'm sure they're negotiable on it too, um, especially if you buy it as a package. I kind of suggested I was like, might be able to get more if you broke them up. And tried to sell them that way because um, you can cash flow a lot easier with one property um, than, than buying it as a you know as a bundle. Uh, but that's kind of where they where they landed. So we'll see what their plan is with that. Um, they could be willing to sell two or three of them at a time, maybe not the whole six. So let me know. So the next one was the one Hannah and I were talking about. Um, this is the one I kept just going back and forth on. 
<laughs> so this is on uh, Randolph Ave in Pulaski, like one of the main streets that go down into downtown. Uh, it's a four bed, currently it's a four bed, one bath. Um, there's, a, there's a room upstairs that we're probably gonna turn into a second bath if we go that route. Uh, we put this under contract at 20,000. I think the, the lot is like 0.3 acres or something like that. Um, 20,000, no, 0.3, sorry. Yeah, no, that'd be nice. I wouldn't have debated that one too much. Um, so the story behind this though, we went and looked at it. There's a garage, there's a garage or a building right here. And I won't bring the guy's name up, but um, there was some confusion. Like we reached out to him when we were negotiating this deal to see if he'd be willing to sell that building. Um, and he said yes, and we, we negotiated a price. And then we went to send him the contract he said, oh, I thought I was actually purchasing the house, not selling my building. And I was like, that doesn't necessarily make sense because we went, we went up in price and you agreed to it. So that is, why would you agree to pay more than, would, like, than what the original price was? So that was, that was strange. But so it kind of, that put some question marks in my head with this. It was like having the building, uh, you know, buying it at 20, like it probably needs $100,000 worth of work. Um, you know, now you, it would probably would have sold like 215 or at least list price 215, four bed, two bath in Pulaski. Um, you know, comps around it have sold. There's two bedrooms on the same street that have sold for 150, 160. So, you know, the, the price is there, but that building's kind of out of play now. I reached out to the guy, talked to him. You know, he was pretty, he was pretty stubborn on like trying to make a deal work, I think and this is just me kind of reading between the lines, I think he's hoping I would back out and he could buy the property and do exactly what I was trying to do with it. Um, so, you know, kind of thought about that. Thought process now is buy it with cash, either go ahead and flip it, um, turn it into a rental instead of trying to make a margin. You know, if the, if the margins aren't there, you can turn it around, turn around, put a loan on it, rent it out. Um, you know, there's still, there's still margin there if you, could sell it at 180 um, and only had that 100,000 into it. Um, the development aspect, when I was talking to the gentleman that owns the building, he said, well, you know, what my plan was if I were to ever get that building was to just bulldoze all of it and put an apartment there. Apartment there. And he said, you know, there's, I'd be willing to partner with you on something like that if you buy the building. Um, don't know what those numbers look like yet. Don't know how serious he is. He is a pretty, a uh, prominent contractor uh, in this area and around the NRV. So kind of what I'm thinking now is, you know, purchase it for $20,000, sit on it for a little bit. Maybe once it's, bought, once it's bought, he changes his mind on keeping that building. Um, you know, once he realizes that he's not going to get the house, he might not be as, as worried about keeping the building. There's a, there's a lawnmower inside. <laughs> That yeah. you can have it if you want. No, I can't. Yeah, I don't know how they got that lawnmower in there because it does not fit through any of the doors. <laughs> so <laughs> there's just a lawnmower sitting in the in the hallway. Um, yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> so that's kind of you know this plan. If, if we get to the point where you know somebody's willing to to go in and help with the 20k down payment, sit on it and figure something out, like that's an opportunity. Uh, we're closing on it end of July, so if it's of any interest to anybody, let me know. So, <laughs> don't you love these pictures? Like point, point. This was a this was yeah. This was a video I was taking, and I was pointing and explaining. So when I screenshot it, it's just me pointing to everything. So this is actually across the street. Sorry if you guys can't see it. This is across the street um, from that Randolph property. When Hannah and I were over there, um, you know, we were talking to some neighbors and they said a bunch of things, but they were pointed, pointed across the street and they were like, that property has been uh, vacant for a long time. And we said, well, heck, we might as well go over there and look at it. The doors were unlocked, so we, we just kind of walked through it. Um, ended up, again, figuring out who it was. He's actually a realtor, so we already had his number. I didn't have to look him up. Um, Hannah reached out to him. 
and you know he's willing to sell it went back and and walked through it and bones are good you know it's in it's in pretty rough shape to be completely honest with you but for 12 units um obviously it's class d maybe f depending on how you <laughs> how you value it um but we had jes come out foundation's good you know the bones are good you put new roofs on this property and that property um this was a single family home at one point uh and they have it's got three floors they've been kind of sectioned off in between the three so you could have three separate apartments each of them were three bedrooms i believe um and then it is attached to this brick building that they built uh quite a bit afterwards and this has four more units in it um five maybe Actually, I think this might have four in it. And then these have four. There's one in the front, one in the back, and then upstairs there's one on the top, one in the back. Um, those are actually, you know, apart from like redoing the kitchens and the bathrooms and the flooring and stuff, like they're it's in pretty decent shape. Like not a lot of water damage or anything like that. And then this building is beside this one, um, and it's a fourplex. So obviously a ton of renovation is needed. Um, but got the purchase price at about 245000 And, you know, depending on how you structure it with the bank, the thought process is to, like, you know, maybe, maybe purchase a loan, do these renovations first, get some tenants in there, like, at least help with the, um, the debt burden. If not cover it, at least it'll get close so you're, you know, you're not spending as much money. And then tackle the bigger projects, uh, starting with this back one. Those aren't going to take that much work, but you can get you know another four units on board, and then at the end of it, tackle that big property um, in the front. Which need this one needs a new roof, uh, new flooring, pretty much pretty much everything in that one besides maybe the uh, besides maybe the drywall and stuff. So, you know those are those are all coming online. Uh, we haven't necessarily figured out the exact plan with all of them. Um, you know, depending on down payment things along those lines we'll probably need to bring some partners in uh you know and, and we can talk about returns and preferred returns and things like that at that point um but we just put this under contract today and we we put a pretty pretty decent um due diligence period and close date on it so we've got some time to figure it out with with the bank and and things along those lines um so if any of these interest you please let me know the last one is more of a it's a real estate play but it's a business that we've been working on for about a year now and we're gonna do a luncheon two Wednesdays two Wednesdays from now uh, I think at our office where we come in and kind of give you the full rundown uh, which is what we're kind of planning on do with these two if anybody's interested but July 12th um, July 12th we're gonna have as many people as we can get uh, we're going to cater a lunch from our restaurant, Bluegrass Barbecue, uh, and really go over in detail what our plans are with this business and um, what we're doing. So we are under contract for this building as well in Pulaski. Um, Jamie actually is one of the, the former JS members who secured it for us. Um, and we've you know kind of got with him and some of the other members that bought this building about a year, year and a half ago now. Um, and we're gonna take these. Come to the lunch. Yeah, come. We'll, we'll explain it all. Yeah, he wants it. He wants it sold. Bluegrass. Yeah. Um, but the concept here is to take these old abandoned schools, which are freaking everywhere, um, because you know counties and localities are consolidating, and there's only, especially in rural areas, there's so many some apartments that you can build um, in these schools. Um, but we're gonna buy them at a low cost renovate them using historic tax credits which subsidizes your development cost by like up to 45 percent a lot of times and then lease the space out to vertical farming companies that will come in and use space like the auditorium to grow produce and um you know other crops and things like that in not, the not. in the facility yeah not weed we're not ruling it out but <laughs> you know, know maybe maybe one of these like rooms. Vertical, so like, one of that's favorite. that's literally the first yeah that's the first thing anyone ever says about it. But um, no, it's uh, if you're not familiar with vertical farming, it's super interesting concept. 
um, the advancements in like LED lighting technology and just hydroponics in general um, have allowed us to take a lot of the the um, grow process from the ground and bring it inside. And in most cases, you can grow about six to ten acres worth of crops inside uh, in a one acre footprint. So you can really get your like maximized yield. You can turn the crops over faster. It's all controlled. There's no pesticides. Um, you know, there's no weather that you have to worry about. So winter time, you can grow straight through the winter. Um, there's a lot of benefits of it. And Virginia is actually like the hub for CEA right now, which is controlled environmental agriculture. But there's some big, big companies doing this uh, on a much good. Obviously, there's there's a while to go and proof of concept, but vertical farming is a solution to world food prices in places where they can't grow things. You can put a building up in the middle of the desert and have a growth, like a growth facility, assuming you have access to like water. Mm -hmm. Water is the you have to have, which uh, it's an amazing concept and. You know, Cody was um, particularly good at thinking through the process of what, what's the easiest mechanism to get, what's the easiest mechanism to find places to do these. And the, you know, in construction, the biggest barrier for companies that want to do these type of facilities is the infrastructure problem. So if you find a way to tell them, hey, we might be able to have a mechanism in place where you can do your, your improvements, your construction costs, for 50% of what it would cost anybody else. That's a pretty amazing opportunity to turn, to turn these, in many ways, abandoned buildings yep. into use. And there's also lots of other potential economic incentives, economic development incentives with employees, you know, job creation, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um I, I mean I've heard the old school from Tony Holt's son. And I will tell you that it's um something I have a high level of There's we've talked to one, we talked to a lot of localities because we were trying to figure out how many schools there were that were available and they've got multiple and they're literally like, We will give you these things yeah. if you guys will come in and, and do the project. Um create ten jobs. Yeah, create jobs, you know, provide provide um organic non-pesticide produce to our region uh, there's just so many like like variables to it and we've done over probably a hundred customer discovery interviews now with vertical farmers or people that are in that industry in and around that industry and the biggest thing is always the real estate costs so much the development costs so much and we're farmers we're not developers so we're spending time and expertise on people that that's not our wheelhouse and then that debt burden is on their books. So it's eating into their margins, it's eating into what they're actually able to grow in their facilities. Um, so this creates space for them to come and lease out from us and they don't have the debt on their books and the risk of the real estate behind it. Um, and we can kind of, because it's classroom, we can compartmentalize what's grown in each thing and bring different companies in that do different things to kind of spread that risk across. And we're super excited about it. There's a environmental like climate smart piece to it where we're trying to we're trying to make it a carbon negative grow environment so we can sell carbon credits and things like that based on um, our processes so would love to I'm not going to spend too much time on it but would love for you guys to come to that so again we're going to have our barbecue from our restaurant there we'll buy you lunch probably no, I'm not sure exactly where the luncheon is, but we'll send an email out. Um, no, it'll be it'll be in Blacksburg, most likely. Yeah, the, the building is in Pulaski. Yes. I don't think we want to do that. <laughs> I'm not eating lunch in there. So, um, yeah. So that's it, guys. Um, you know, appreciate it. I think I still went over on time, but there was a lot of more group discussion, which is good. Um, everybody grab a beer if you got your tickets. The first two were on us. Um, talk some deals. That was my favorite part actually. The first one was we kind of all got in a little huddle and talked about the deals we had going on and, and 
how to leverage each other and things like that. So make sure you're making those connections and see you next month, hopefully. Thanks.